Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Sunt. Welcome to my first YouTube video. I thought for this first watercolor video, I would do an activity that is really fun and relaxing and is a great video for people who are just starting out with watercolor, who might be intimidated because they've been looking on Pinterest and Instagram and have no idea where to start. So this is a great activity for people to get to know the watercolor paints on their palette. It is low pressure because it's all about information gathering and we're not creating a final piece. Although I would argue that the thing that we do is really cute so you can stick it in a frame anyway. But there are no mistakes because everything that you're doing is just learning on the page. It's also great for people who want a practice that can replace the constant checking Facebook and checking the news and having a practice that is more creative and an outlet for people who are kind of stressed out by everything that's going on right now. So for this activity, you need some paper, some a brush, and some paints. So grab your materials and come join me. I'm gonna start by running through the supplies that we'll be using today. So I have just a small five by seven piece of watercolor paper. And this is Arches 140 pound cold pressed paper, which is my go-to. Paper is the most important material with watercolor to get of high quality. You can practice your skills with brushes and paints that aren't the highest quality. But with paper, if it's lower quality paper, no matter how good your skills are, you're not gonna be able to get the effects that you want. So even for this practice, I like to use paper that I would use for a final piece because then I'm practicing the skills using the same type of paper that I would be doing a finished piece with. I'm also going to list all the supplies that I use at the bottom of this YouTube video so you don't need to go back through the video and search. I'm also gonna be using a Princeton Neptune number no. eight round. This is my favorite brand of brush and this is probably my favorite brush that I have. Princeton is really affordable. It's synthetic so we're not using the real animal hair but it mimics that hair really well. You can use any brush for this activity. I probably wouldn't go lower than around eight or around six because then the brush won't be able to have as much paint and water stored up and you'd have to just keep going back and replenishing it. I have my mason jar of water set to the side. I have some paper towel which is used to dab off water and excess paint. And I have my palette. I have a lot of colors here. You can do this activity with as few as three colors. I'm probably going to use a handful, five or six. We'll just kind of see where it takes us. So I'm gonna start by getting water in my brush and really loading that up. And then I'm going to go into any color that I want. And this is a color exploration activity. And what that means is we're seeing the color on our paper and we're also going to be seeing how the colors interact with each other and the relationships that they have. I find when I'm doing watercolor that the paints all have their own personality. Some of them are kind of chill and just hang out where I drop them in. Some of them are aggressive and I call them bully paints because they kind of just elbow their way into any situation, which is fun, but a little hard to control. I think I'm gonna start with a red. This is a quinacridone red. I think all, most of my paints are Daniel Smith. Just personal preference, I live in Seattle. Okay, and I'm just gonna be doing a line all the way down the page. I really want a lot of saturation, a lot of deep, rich color. So I'm gonna be seeing how this red interacts with the paint that I lay down next to it. I went over it a couple times 
because it started really dark here and it got a little bit lighter as the brush kind of ran out of that pigment. It's completely fine. Next to it, I'm gonna put down a yellow gold. This is quinacridone gold and this is one of those colors that I said I think is a bully color. This is by Core and this is a really aggressive color and I love using it, but watch out. <laughs> that has a mind of its own. As I lay down the second color, I'm going to every so often touch the two lines together. You can start to see that gold goes immediately into the red. Even though it's a lighter color, it's more aggressive and it's gonna take over. And that's interesting knowledge to get about this color because it's something I wouldn't have thought when I originally bought it. See how it's starting to bleed. So with watercolor, we're not so much painting with paint, we're painting with water with some pigment mixed in. So half of the battle is learning about how much water to have on the paper, how much water to have in the brush, how much water to put on the paint originally. And usually I think of the consistency of paint as being that of milk, a little bit thicker than water, but not like acrylic where it's really the paint that you're kind of slackening with some water. So I'm really liking how those are mixing. I'm gonna go in with a magenta. This is quinacridone magenta, and this is by Core as well, which means it's probably gonna be one of those bully colors, and we're gonna see between the gold and the magenta which one's gonna win. It's so like that card game, I think it's called Super Fight, which who would win in a fight, and then you have to choose like a shark with chainsaws or a bear with C4, you know, which will win, gold or magenta? Hmm, kind of a stalemate. The magenta seems to be winning, and I think that's because it is wetter than the gold at this point, because the gold has been drying for a little bit, and it's pushing itself in. We're gonna try a blue now. I'm gonna use my Prussian blue. This is one of my favorite blues. You mix it with yellows, and it makes some amazing greens. This is probably, if I had to choose one blue, it would probably be Prussian blue. I'll lay that one down. And notice I'm not making them touch everywhere because I don't want them to mix completely. I still want the colors to stay themselves, but I wanna see how they interact. You can see how that magenta is coming in. And so what this teaches me is if I'm painting a piece with these two colors, I'm gonna wanna be careful. If I want the blue to be dominating in a piece, I'm gonna have to be careful as I lay down the magenta because I know it's gonna take over. And I'm also assuming it's gonna make a pretty lovely purple if I mix them. Oh yeah. Let's try another blue. This is cobalt teal. This is really fun to use for tropical water. It's almost turquoise, a little bit lighter than that, but it just makes some beautiful colors. You might find as you're mixing or letting these colors touch, I'm being very intentional with the colors that I'm choosing, but you might choose two colors that when they start interacting, you say, oh my gosh, that is so ugly. Turned brown, red alert. 
But remember with this, this is all about information gathering. There are no mistakes because all it is is information and lessons. You're not trying to make something beautiful necessarily, although I think the interactions are beautiful. But if you mix two colors and they turn brown and you think it looks muddy and ugly, guess what? Next time you're making a landscape and you want a brown, hey, you know what two colors to mix together. Instead of buying a brown or using a pre-made brown, now you know what colors to mix in order to create brown. Great. I really love what's happening here. It's almost just little bursts of the cobalt teal going into the Prussian blue. We're gonna go really dark with my new favorite color. This is Indigo by Daniel Smith. It's almost this midnight color, but then it can turn into this really beautiful deep blue. You can tell I'm really loading up my brush. I'm not being afraid of getting a lot of paint in there. And again, my consistency of paint on my palette is milk. This indigo, you can see when it's lighter, it's this bluey gray, really steely, pretty, pretty color. I like using this color when I'm doing monochrome paintings, meaning it's the only color that I use for things like misty pines or mountains, because I can get the black all the way down to a more muted blue. And the mixing isn't happening a ton, which is interesting because that cobalt was really going to town there with the Prussian blue, but they're kind of hanging out. I'm gonna see how a purple does with this. Can't remember which purple this is, but I'll list it below. Ooh, yeah, the indigo. Straight in there. This allows you to see color combinations that you might not have thought of at first. This is a good activity to keep on hand afterwards because then you can see, oh, what were those two colors that really blended into something pretty? Oh yeah, it's the Prussian blue and cobalt, or oh yeah, it's that gold that's really, notice how as it's drying at first, it really rushed in to the other colors, but then as it's drying, it kind of bled back. That is really interesting to know. We'll try a soft pink. This is Opera Rose. This is really nice to use for flowers. Surprise, surprise, it's really nice to use for roses. Who would have thought? It's not a color I would originally think that I would like because it's very pinky. And when I do landscapes, I do more greens and soft blues and browns, but I have a lot of fun using this color for botanical roses. We'll try to squeeze two more into there. I'm gonna do a yellow. Mm. We'll use yeah, this is Hansa Yellow Medium. This is just a great go-to yellow to mix some basic greens. Or mix some oranges when you use it with pink or red. Yeah, that'll get a nice orange.
I think the last one I'll do is this green gold. This is an interesting, can't tell if it's more green or more yellow. I, I have it with my greens because I use it for landscapes. I, I dull it down with some other colors to get a really great foliage color, but it's an interesting one on its own. It's very similar to this yellow. And when I look at them on my palette, they don't look similar at all. That's the green gold. And that's the Hansa yellow medium. But when they put when I put them down on the palette or on the paper, they look pretty similar. All right, you can do this activity with any size paper. You can do this activity with any size brush, although I would say the bigger paper you go, the bigger brush you're gonna wanna use, like maybe a number 12 or even a flat, a flat brush. You can do this with any shape. You could do this with squiggles. You could do this with circles and have them touching and overlapping and have that same process of how do they interact and mix with each other. You could do this with triangles. You could do this with any shape because ultimately the goal is to get yourself familiar with your paints because once you do that, when you go to paint a landscape or a floral or any kind of composition, you're not stopping and taking the time to figure out what paint is best because you already know. It's like shorthand. You just, you get to know them and their personalities, like their people, and then you go straight into, okay, what's, I want a color that's really rich and vibrant and is gonna be able to handle its own and not get taken over by other colors. So I'm gonna go with this um, quinacridone magenta, something like that. So I'm gonna let this dry and then we're gonna finish up. So here's the final piece of paper after things have dried. And you may notice as it dries, watercolor has a mind of its own. And so things may have happened in the drying process that you didn't prepare for or plan or possibly want. Um, but that's the beauty of watercolor. You are a participant. You are not the only one in charge here, which is a great thing to realize for people who might find themselves to be a little bit more control freaks like me that there is a beauty that watercolor has a mind of its own. And you can learn to facilitate that, but you can't control it 100%. You have to kind of let go to some of the process. So for instance, what I found here is this indigo traveled beautifully into this purple and even traveled a little bit into the opera rose and created some really interesting purples. Whereas up here, we have a, almost like a polka dot effect of left to its own devices. It's not going to meld beautifully. It's going to aggressively go in and then kind of stay there. It's all interesting things to learn. But I hope you try this activity and get to know the colors on your palette a little bit better. If you try this activity, let me know how it went in the comments, what colors surprised you, what color combinations were your favorite. I'm always interested in adding more paints to my palette. So thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.